Back in the early 2000s, Pac-Man had somewhat of a resurgence, with a ton of new games that were not only commercial successes, but were also well-received amongst critics and players alike. However, now Pac-Man is barely relevant, with most of the series' output being mobile-focused. The series is now being kept alive largely through cameos and the odd promotion here and there. So, what happened here? Let's go back a few decades. In 1984, Pac-Man broke out of the maze and went on a side-scrolling platformer adventure called Pac-Land. This game was revolutionary and even influential, only to be unfortunately overshadowed by similar games that would come after. From there, the Pac-Man series continued to experiment with games like the isometric maze game Pac-Mania, a puzzle game called Pac-Attack, and so on. We would see Pac-Land again in the bizarre yet captivating Pac-Man 2 The New Adventures, and Pac-Man would return to the platforming scene again in pac and time However, neither of these games really elevated the series' status in the eyes of many. However, during the lifespan of the original PlayStation, a project was brewing at Namco of America. They had plenty of pitches in mind, one of them being an RPG where all the classic Namco arcade games took place in the same universe. However, Namco of Japan told them to just make a 3D Pac-Man platformer instead. While the initial project called Ghost Zone had a troubled development cycle before being cancelled, the team was restructured and they went back to the drawing board. Interestingly, elements from their Namco RPG idea manifested themselves in the new Pac-Man project. There weren't just going to be Pac-Man characters, we were going to get Pukas from Dig Dug, Galga spaceships and aliens, and on top of that, they would make their own creations as well. The end result was Pac-Man World. Not only was it a great successor to Pac-Land, but it also did what no other Pac-Man platformer could do before it. Seamlessly incorporate the platforming gameplay and the original maze gameplay. They took advantage of the 3D space and made the ghost AI remarkably faithful to the original maze game, and grabbing a power pellet and eating them was just as satisfying as ever. Then the developers went the extra mile and gave them different costumes reflecting what environment they were in. That and it was legitimately really good at being a platformer too. It also gave Pac-Man two moves that accommodated his ball-like design. The rev roll and the butt bounce. The rev roll was your standard spin dash type move, good for rolling up slopes and whatnot. However, the butt bounce is one of the most fun mechanics in a platformer. Its impact on the ground is similar to a ground pound, but here, it's also a reliable means of continuous movement. The bounce is higher than a standard jump, and once again, you can just use it continuously. If you wanted, you could just bounce your way all the way to the end of the stage. Then we got Ms. Pac-Man Maze Madness, which takes the maze gameplay of the past and turns it into a puzzle action game similar in tone and feel to the world games with several levels to traverse. The game is also really damn good. Then we got Pac-Man World 2, often seen as the best of the adventure-oriented Pac-Man games, and if you ask me, rightfully so. It was a bit more straightforward than the original, but it was even more varied with its platforming and hazards, the ghost interactions were even more fun than in World 1, it gave the ghosts different classes with some now throwing projectiles at you, it introduced more characters, Pac-Man's animations were really expressive and demonstrated real attention to detail, it refined the controls to a point where I consider it to have some of the best controls in a 3D platformer, it gave Pac-Man new moves, it allowed you to unlock the old arcade games, it made the platforming absurdly satisfying, and it felt legitimately epic. It's here where I need to talk about something that is consistent amongst these three games. The soundtracks are really damn good. Granted, some of the Pac-Man games of the past had really good songs, Pac-Mania especially, but these games took that to a whole new level, and Pac-Man World 2 may just have the absolute best soundtrack in any Pac-Man game. 
Then we had Pack and Roll for the Nintendo DS, which was like the World Games and Maze Madness, but if you combine them with Super Monkey Ball, it is actually a way better ball rolling based platformer than Super Monkey Ball Snap at the premise. Both of us really do believe the early 2000s was the height of Pac-Man's career post-1980. Not only did the franchise manage to pick up a new audience of kids, but longtime fans also enjoyed these sort of games too. These games all had a consistent tone and style, despite being passed around from team to team and shifting genres. They established a charming world with charming characters and gave us some really fun adventures. They were like if you took a really good platformer or adventure game, combined that with everything that made Pac-Man fun to begin with, and gave it the kind of charm and attention to the world that you don't see in games like Mario outside of the RPGs. Even some of the smaller spin-offs by other studios entirely, like Pac-Man Adventures in Time, also retained a lot of this. Not to mention, most of these games were legitimately successful. Pac-Man World 2 in particular sold like hotcakes on all platforms of release. It reached greatest hit status on PS2, Platinum hits on Xbox, Player's Choice Edition on GameCube, and the Player's Choice GameCube release also happened to come with a multiplayer Pac-Man game designed by Shigeru Miyamoto with Mario as the announcer and is also one of the best multiplayer games on the GameCube. The early 2000s were a glorious time to be a Pac-Man fan. Then everything changed when the mid-2000s happened. Pac-Man World 3 is an interesting failure. Whereas the first two games focused heavily on platforming while seamlessly integrating the Pac-Dot and Ghost Eating from the arcade games, this is a combat-oriented game with the original Pac-Man elements feeling separated and slapped on, and in both areas the game really doesn't work. The combat is beyond horrendous, and the spectral monster sections are a chore and a half. This was also the point in time where platformers were trying to be edgier, like Jack 2 and Shadow the Hedgehog. Pac-Man World 3 is Pac-Man's stab at this sort of thing. Hell, they even redesigned Pac Village to look more like Sandover Village so they could mimic Jack 2's opening to a T. In fact, even the platforming and enemy designs are closer to Jack 2's than anything resembling Pac Man. Not only is the gameplay off, but the world and characters are also off. This doesn't feel like the same world, and these don't feel like the same characters. It's kind of amusing to me because Pac Man's characters and mythos aren't that complicated. If anything, they're charming in their simplicity, and yet this game continuously messes that stuff up. This would be one thing if the game was fun, and it's just a slog. From what snippets I've heard from the developers in interviews and whatnot, this game had a very troubled development cycle. They have even told me, you would be surprised this game ever got released, and for their sakes, I'm glad that it was. This is a weirdly ambitious game with clearly a lot of work put into it. It would be horrible to work endlessly on something with a lot of chaos making everything harder, only for all that to ultimately amount to nothing. So yeah, I'm glad that was released and that they got paid, and I can admire how they stuck to their guns. I just don't think it ultimately works out in the end as a fun game. It's not without its positives, or without its fans, frankly it's too bizarre and strange for it not to. I just think too much holds those things back for me to call the game good. In fact, this is probably the prime example of an identity crisis game. Pac-Man was originally created in direct response to the abundance of games based in violence, shooting aliens and whatnot. Pac-Man was designed to be, by contrast, very cute and approachable, something aimed for girls and couples, yet now Pac-Man has become the very kind of game that the series was trying to avoid being. After World 3, we got a surprisingly really good kart racer called Pac-Man World Rally, but after that, the World series and the adventure-oriented games in general came to a very quiet end. Apart from World 3's troubled development, it was also barely advertised by Namco themselves, and for the most part, went unheard of, even the fans of the first two games. And considering how Namco was in a tight financial position and originally wanted to pull the plug on the project, leading to the game being rushed and having a ton of content cut from it, yeah, it's safe to say marketing never was really one of Namco's strong suits. And unsurprisingly, the final retail numbers didn't even come close to those of World 1 and 2's, closing the book on the world formula and Pac-Man adventure games for a long time to come. Sure, they ported Pack and Roll to the Wii as part of the Namco Museum remix, but that wasn't new. Around this time, Namco merged with Bandai, forming Namco Bandai Games, or Bandai Namco Games, or whatever they want to be called this month. 
Under them we got Championship Edition, which was great for fans of the maze game, and it was cool to see a new game in the series by creator Toru Iwatani, however this ended up being more or less all we were going to get from that point forward, and fans of the characters in World were pretty underserved. They even cancelled Maze Madness 2. So with this apparent Pac-Man adventure famine, and with other linear 3D platformers with bizarrely epic orchestral music like Super Mario Galaxy coming out, a lot of us jumped ship and moved on. Then in 2013, not only were we getting a new Pac-Man TV show called Pac-Man and the Ghostly Adventures, but there was also a brand new 3D platformer based on it. There's gonna be a TV show? About me? This series took place in a different continuity with a different world and different rules. Not to mention, every other character that wasn't Pac-Man and the four ghosts was gone. A lot of people unfamiliar to the Pac-Man series outside of the maze games didn't understand it, and a lot of fans of the world games were upset because they saw it as a replacement for World. Some even boycotting it so Ghostly Adventures would end and World would come back. Well, uh, one of those things certainly happened. Despite being a huge fan of the world games, I myself wasn't a part of this group, in part because of the big time gap. To be fair, a lot of the fans who were part of this outcry were younger, so this might not have been so major to them, but it had been 8 years since the last world game, and that's IF you count World 3. If you don't, then it had been 11 years since the last big console 3D platformer in the series. I just didn't see them making a new world game or any game in that style or tone again, as they've displayed no interest in doing so since the merger. I didn't see it as a replacement if the thing that it was supposedly replacing was long dead, so I kind of just saw it as them throwing us a bone after starving us. The TV show I might want to cover in more detail another time, but in case I don't, I'll sum up my thoughts here. I thought the show was fine. Season 1 was pretty consistently good, but from there it became very hit or miss. Granted, those hits were some of the best episodes of the whole show, but the misses just kept growing in numbers. I felt that the show went on for too long, and they should have just gone out on a finale that tied up the overarching conflict surrounding the genocide of the Yellow Pack people, yes you heard me correctly, and the mystery of Pac-Man's parents. Instead, they go off on a goddamn cliffhanger. So with that, let's talk about the games. The first Ghostly Adventures game was a breath of fresh air to me. By that point, games like Mario Galaxy 2 and Sonic Colors made me sick to death of 2D sections and 3D platformers. I missed the branching paths and wide open spaces of older 3D platformers. So in this game, which was a wide open 3D platformer with an adjustable camera with branching paths, detours, and so on was announced, I was ecstatic. Not just as a Pac-Man fan, but also as a fan of this style of 3D platformer, which was more or less dead at the time. However, since then we've gotten games like Super Mario Odyssey, and yeah, this isn't in the same ballpark, but it's still a pretty good game. Though, because of subsequent games like Mario Odyssey, it makes it all the more fun, and by fun I mean painful, to go back to how the gaming press and others reacted to the nature of this game. In mass, people were talking about how this kind of game died for a reason, and antiquated early 2000s style platformers have no place in today's gaming market. Then Mario did it, and suddenly everyone's okay with it again. Probably because of this feedback, Ghostly Adventures 2 is more like the 3D platformers that were coming out around that time, like Super Mario 3D World, for example. I was kind of disappointed upon hearing that and was a little more skeptical about it, but at the same time, I was looking forward to it. Then it came out. This game is awesome. Not just good for the time like the original Ghostly Adventures was, no, like actually really, really good. This game deserves way more love than it gets. It's more of a typical Mario inspired affair than the other Pac-Man platformers, but I'd honestly rather play this than any of the Mario games from the early 2010s. However, they still do things like integrate mazes into the levels even if they're just for bonuses a lot of the time. And while the ghost interactions aren't like the old games, the enemy design is still great. On top of that, the level design is varied and memorable. Some of the scenarios are really fun, even on just a conceptual level. Then you have... The music. <music> oh. 
Overall, I would say that this game is at least on par with a lot of the other Pac-Man platformers, and after a particularly long absence of them, that was really nice to have again. After that, we've gotten... NOTHING! ABSOLUTELY NOTHING! STUPID! YOU'RE SO STUPID! The Pac-Man series in general is at a serious low point right now. Since 2014, the only real major release is Pac-Man Championship Edition 2, which I'll be honest, I didn't really care for. I bought it on launch day, I played it for like 6 hours, and I haven't touched it since. I'm fine with the original and DX, but at this point it really feels like they're trying to milk a cow that has already been processed into hamburgers. It's honestly a shame that the Championship Edition series is going the way of the new Super Mario Bros. games, because I really do think there is plenty of potential that they could do with the maze formula, yet for the most part they are just simply remaking or remixing the original arcade game with the same aesthetic and premise of simplicity. Yes, the original is a classic, but evolution is very much important. You can't just get away with making the same thing over and over. Pac-Mania did more, Pac-Man Arrangement did more, Adventures in Time and Maze Madness practically show just how much depth you can give the maze formula. Outside of that, we've got a bunch of iOS and Android games with plenty of those feeling more like existing mobile games with Pac-Man slapped onto it. There. Mm -hmm. Now it's Pac-Man. In fact, almost all of their classic IPs have been abandoned for years. When's the last time we've seen anything meaningful from Galaga, Dig Dug, Klonoa, and Ridge Racer? Okay, a little bit of an editor's note here, but it's been brought to my attention while working on this video that there's a new mobile Galaga game called Galaga Revenge that uses a free-to-play model because everyone loves those, and features generic anime characters that look so generic they look like they're pulled from some visual novel character pack with personalities to match. Because when I think of Galaga, I think of anime tits. You want to have solid arcade action? Screw that! Have gratuitous cleavage! And if you're a fan of terrible writing straight out of an anime or an RPG that also has an inexplicable urge to persist insult the mentally challenged, then you will be well served here. Also, one of the waifus is named Leia. This is a sci-fi game with spaceships shooting at each other, and you name one of your protagonists Leia. Leia. Friggin' Leia. If all of that sounds excellent to you, Bandai Namco will be sure to make sure you're not even aware of it. Instead, they'll be promoting the latest Sword Art Online release because kill me. Going back to Namco games from the PS1 era is interesting to say the least. Not only were they creating new IPs, but they were also continuing to do new things with their old ones too, and even in the newer ones we had affectionate nods and references to the older ones as well. Everything was in perfect balance. Like, relatively recently I started getting into the original Namco Museum games on PS1. Now, what set these apart from their subsequent iterations is that these had actual virtual museums to explore, filled with memorabilia, trivia, and little rooms dedicated to the worlds of the games they represented. You really got the sense that they cared and were passionate for these games. Now, pretty much all their IPs have been left in the dust. Instead, Bandai Namco have been focusing on licensed games based on anime like Sword Art Online. Why? Like Dragon Ball, I can kind of get behind, but Sword Art Online? Oh, come on now, it can't be that bad. I'm level 78. I got 14,500 HP. We could stand here all day and you wouldn't get anywhere. <clears throat> That's not possible. Wanna bet? If your numbers are high enough, you're invincible. MMOs that use leveling systems are unfair that way. Hmm, how do I articulate how this feels? Imagine if Nintendo stopped making Mario and Zelda games and dropped all of their other IPs so they can make games based on the Michael Bay Transformers movies. It hurts. It hurts a lot. It'd be one thing if they were making these licensed games concurrently with their original IPs, but it feels like they're abandoning their IPs in favor of working on these licensed games. And look at how well those are turning out lately. Meanwhile, other long-dead platformer series from the late 90s started making comebacks. Crash Bandicoot and Spyro got full-blown remakes. Mario returned to the collectathon format. And even Bubsy is back, with Chris Holzbeck and Fabian Del Prior music, no less. Nostalgic throwbacks to the Nintendo 64 and PlayStation 1 era are really in right now, and are proving to be very profitable, yet Namco is doing nothing to capitalize on this. 
It's clear that we're in the midst of another pack famine, and yet this time I'm actually more upset than I was during the previous one, in part because this happened right after Ghostly Adventures 2. They have proven that they can outsource a Pac-Man platformer and turn out a great one, and yet... Ah, uh, no, I don't really feel like it. In fact, because of its commercial failure, I fear that they took it not just as people don't want ghostly adventures, but people don't want Pac-Man platformers, period, despite that very clearly not being the case. I'm honestly kind of guilty that I didn't pick up Ghostly Adventures 2, and sadly, I wasn't the only one who got bad impressions from it. This reflected in the sales numbers, selling even worse than its predecessor and people outright bashing the game for barely being above something like Mario 64. It was barely even given a single chance the moment it was revealed. Not helped by the fact that the game was revealed in early March of 2014. The reason I mention this is because the mere mention of Pac-Man himself was starting to leave bitter taste in fans of other Namco properties' mouths. Most notoriously, Klonoa fans. I won't go into too much detail, but I don't think Factor 5 fanatic here has mentioned Klonoa outside of a few live streams and comments. But it was another set of platformer adventure games ranging from the late 90s to early 2000s. Heavily acclaimed ones that heavily focused on narrative. The series was eventually basically killed off in 2008 when the Wii remake of the original game didn't end up selling well. Though there was hope in the form of a webcomic that was being produced by Shifty Look, a former branch of Namco that tried to reserve most of their forgotten IPs with supplemental material. However, Namco closed the studio shortly after the announcement of Ghostly Adventures 2, leaving the webcomic on a cliffhanger. At this point, it wasn't too uncommon to see people pointing fingers claiming Pac-Man was being quote-unquote milked. And while I do think that they heavily pushed Ghostly Adventures far too much for its own good, and I don't deny that there was a period when Pac-Man was milked, that was a long time ago, in the 80s. You can do it. The series had never been in that sort of state again, and probably for the better. However, considering Championship Edition DX managed to sell boatloads more than both of the Ghost Adventures games combined, along with receiving so much critical praise I personally can't say I agree with it, it leads us to where we are now. It also doesn't help that during the last dry period, that being between World Rally and Ghostly Adventures, we at least got Pac-Man Party, a remake of Pack and Roll, and Championship Edition wasn't completely beaten into the ground by this point. There was still something to be excited about. Nowadays, hope you like mobile games and random promotions because that's just about all you're going to get. Like, a long absence of a series doesn't necessarily mean that the developers or publishers have stopped caring. Sometimes there's complications that prevent it from going any further. However, it really doesn't seem like there are any real complications or roadblocks. Rather, Pac-Man right now feels like that IP that Bandai Namco just doesn't know what to do with, even with the answer screaming in their face. So instead, they just periodically throw small shit out there out of obligation. I just don't feel any sort of passion about it from them. I believe that this perception of nobody wants this is a factor as to why we haven't been getting Pac-Man platformers or anything more substantial than what we've been getting. I can't confirm that, but it is characteristic of the use of this series since the merger. It demonstrates a self-fulfilling prophecy. By halting anything new and exciting being done with the series, it loses relevance, and when something loses relevance, demand for it drops. Like, yes, they would try to pander to the crown that's only familiar with the original arcade game, but regressing a series like this has never turned out well in the long term. After the GameCube flopped, Nintendo tried to regress Mario to be more like his 2D outings to try to recapture the audience those games had. It didn't work. I can't think of a single time where a series regressing itself to appease the misguided demands of pedantic 80s babies has ever elevated a series in the long term. Hell, part of the reason why Pac-Man took off in the 80s was because he was one of gaming's first real characters instead of just a spaceship or whatever. In their efforts to relive these alleged glory days, they have stripped Pac-Man of his character, and now he's just left as that pizza thing from the 80s. In their attempts to pander to what they assume their original audience is, they completely missed the point. 
Since the Bandai merger, the series has gone downhill hard, scrapping the world, characters, charm, and gameplay that attracted a new generation of fans to the franchise and never acknowledges that this era existed outside of Twitter, opting instead to focus on pandering to a demographic that isn't even paying attention. Like, I've met a lot of people who grew up playing the original in the arcades. They're not playing 256 or Championship Edition 2 or what have you. They're not showing these games to their kids. At best, I've seen kids talk about ghostly adventures. Within the fan base, I've seen a lot of resentment towards Bandai Namco and a lot of Bandai ruined Namco sentiment, and it isn't hard for me to see why. Still though, to give some credit, it was awesome to see Pac-Man vs. ported to the Nintendo Switch as part of the Namco Museum on that system. And in Pac-Man Pop, Pac-Village from Pac-Man World 2 makes its first appearance since 2005. They even brought back Pac-Man's dog Chomp Chomp, along with Pac-Man, Pac-Man, wonderful, wonderful news, I'm back from the dead! Hell, the now defunct Pac-Man monsters not only had a story, but also had a lot of fan service to the older games. Spooky was even in it. Granted, you can't play the game anymore, but still. In all honesty, I didn't really mind a lot of these mobile games when, say, the Ghostly Adventures games were coming out, because they were more of a side meal to the main course and not masquerading as an excuse to say, oh, we still make Pac-Man games whenever fans express disappointment. Also, at that point, iOS and Android games were newer and more of a big deal. Nowadays, they're barely a thought on most gamers' minds, and when they are, it isn't often fondly. Mobile games are typically designed as small distractions meant to be played in short bursts, and not really much more than that. Now, that in of itself isn't inherently a problem. The problem is, for a series to go from producing big releases with story, character, platforming, adventure, and variety, all while keeping true to Pac-Man's roots, to small, mediocre distractions, that's a very big step down and isn't going to satisfy those waiting for the next big thing in the series that has yet to come. Do I really need to go into why gamers outright don't like mobile? Never mind the fact that a lot of these games incorporate microtransactions in some way or some form. Yes, Pac-Man is most known for his simplistic, arcade-styled games, but even Bomberman was the same way, and fans of that series weren't happy when Konami started watering down the franchise to simply be mobile games and pachinko slots now, did they? Even before the advent of iOS, Android, and whatnot, relegating your series that once had consistent big releases on computers and consoles to just subpar mobile games was a practice that reeked of, we own this IP that we're obligated to use, but don't want to invest any money into it. Isn't that right, THQ? However, let's say that you not just like the mobile games, but you love them. Let's assume that your phone is still your favorite gaming platform. Even with all of that, they're still not handling things very well. Despite mobile games being Bandai Namco's predominant output for the series, if you go to the App Store today and search for Pac-Man, there's barely anything. We have ports of Pac-Man and Miss Pac-Man, a Wreck-It Ralph promotion, 256, Pac-Man Pop, and Championship Edition DX. That's it. Everything else has been taken down. You can't play them anymore. Some of them, like Pac-Man Monsters, due to the DRM, cannot be played anymore, period. They're lost in time like tears in the rain. There's a lot more you can do with Pac-Man than they've been doing. Even if you're just going to stick to the maze formula, there are plenty of other possibilities. I mean, there's the Maze Madness approach where you take the classic maze gameplay and turn it into a puzzle platform or adventure game of sorts, but you could also take after Pac-Mania, Arrangement, Adventures of Time, or do something completely new with it instead of You like flesh beyond lines? For the 10 millionth time. There is more to Pac-Man than just the original arcade game. And plenty of people like me have been wanting to get back to this series. Sure, we've forgotten it for quite some time and why we used to love it, but now that we remember, we really want to come back. We want to go back on adventures with our little yellow friend again. However, until Namco Bandai gets their heads out of their asses, it's about as likely as seeing a new Klonoa game. Now, I can't speak for other fans on this, but me personally, I don't need constant sequels until the end of time. I am perfectly fine with a series doing its thing, wrapping up, and leaving us to look back on it like, yeah, that was nice. I don't really need a Ghostly Adventures 3. I mean, I would like to see the story actually have a proper conclusion, but as far as gameplay goes, Ghostly Adventures 2 more or less did everything. It reached its max potential, and there's not much more you can do with a sequel beyond just more Ghostly Adventures 2. 
problem is, Pac-Man World doesn't have that. They're absurdly fun games and set a good foundation to build off of, but not only is there room for improvement, but there's a lot more that could be done with it. As good as these games are, they could be even better. However, World 3 not only didn't do this, but it left the World games off on a sour note. This wasn't the Return of the Jedi of Pac-Man World. No, it made me want an actual World 2 sequel more than ever. Now, I'm not doing this because I hate Bandai Namco or whatnot, because I don't. I'm not even angry at them. I'm more perpetually disappointed. I love what they used to be. Their old arcade games are fantastic and still a blast to play. Their games in the late 90s and early 2000s, for me, rival even the best of what other companies like Nintendo were putting out at the time. So it's sad to see them go from that to becoming basically THQ for weeaboos. They used to give me so much, yet now they give me so very little. On a personal note, Pac-Man was to me in my childhood what Mario was to others. So to see games like Mario's Collectathons, Crash, and Spyro come back, and not Pac-Man, while well, I've been really enjoying those other games to hell and back, I must say I do feel a little left out at the same time. However, at the same time, Namco can be unpredictable sometimes. In 2012, I never thought I'd see the yellow guy in a platformer or adventure setting ever again. Only the next year would what was impossible in my mind come to fruition. Within the span of two years, we got three Pac-Man platformers. Alongside televised adventures, the character would go on with a great orchestral score and stunning animation. Even now, they recently remastered Katamari Damacy for the Nintendo Switch after that series was neglected for a while. That's great! It isn't like there isn't demand either. People remember these games. People miss these games. And if they went back and did more with them, I know a lot of people who would buy them. Hell, last year, I attended a global game Jam, an event where you basically lock yourself in a designated location for a weekend with a bunch of other people and try to make a game within that time. On the last day, one of my team members brought in this big ass electronic keyboard and everyone in the room and from the various teams started playing around with it. When I got my chance, I started playing Pac-Man World 2 music on it, and it was quickly recognized as such. I got people coming up to me and asking, was that Pac-Man World 2? Amongst people around my age, it's a well-remembered and liked game. Granted, I've also met people skeptical about Pac-Man working as a 3D platformer, but all I had to do to change their minds was show them the games in action. I've had people go from, I can't see that working, to, wow, that's actually really seamless, within just seconds of gameplay. Even on YouTube, we're starting to see more prominent people talk about these games, and even saying things like this. I mean, like, I totally get it now because I played a lot of Pac-Man as a kid, but never did I ever consider myself a Pac-Man fan, you know? Like, those games are just very simple, kind of fun, but I'm not gonna be a fan of this series. But after playing the Pac-Man World series? Oh man, I would totally consider myself a Pac-Man fan. I guess the current situation with Bandai Namco is for me and other Pac-Man fans what the situation with Capcom and Mega Man fans was like a few years back, and evidently, that situation did get better, so who knows, maybe this will too. But I'm not counting on it. Instead of just holding on to hope for things that may never come, I say we should do what other fan bases of long dormant franchises have done and take action ourselves. Let's come together and do what Namco won't. Instead of concentrating on our collective vehement disappointment, let's put that focus on creating stories, comics, animations, music, fan games, and whatnot. Give ourselves new things to be passionate about. If Namco ends up making a new Pac-Man platformer or adventure game, then fantastic, but if not, let's at the very least have each other.